Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size. With Jamie Ward, University of Sussex, author of The Student's Guide to Cognitive Neuroscience and The Student's Guide to Social Neuroscience. In this Cognitive Neuroscience Bite Size, I'm going to go through the visual dorsal stream or vision for action. So Anger Lydra and Mishkin proposed a broad division between the ventral and the dorsal stream, where the ventral stream was called a what root, involved in recognising what objects are, and the dorsal stream was called a where root, important for locating objects in space. Uh, further on, people such as Goodale and Mil Milner argued that the dorsal stream isn't just a where root, it's involved in acting on objects that in order to know where things are, it's because we need to actually process them functionally in order to do something with them. And they, they renamed the dorsal root the how root. What we find is that the, the dorsal stream has a number of particular properties that are important for linking vision with action. And it's also involved in selecting uh, elements from the visual scene. So a couple of computational problems associated with the dorsal stream is how we link visual information to information about the body. So in order to pick an object up, for instance, we, it's no good just knowing where something is on the retina. We need to know where something is in 3D space outside of the body. So we need to construct a body-centered representation of vision. We need to know the size of objects, the distance of objects from the body, uh, and so on. So we need to link vision with these body-centered information. A second computational problem is how we select from a wide variety of uh, objects in the environment. Which ones are we going to act on and how exactly are we going to do this action? And for this reason, the dorsal stream is also involved in attention. The way that visual neurons work in the dorsal stream is that they don't just respond to the presence of objects in a visual field. They also respond according to whether an object is relevant to a particular task. So whether it is something you are likely to act on or whether it's something that's important. So the dorsal stream is involved in prioritising visual information, uh, focusing primarily on those things that are relevant to action and goals and so on. One way of contrasting the different roles of the ventral stream and the dorsal stream is to look at the effects of brain damage on these particular regions. Brain damage in the ventral stream leads to a problem called visual agnosia. So these patients uh, won't be able to recognise objects presented through vision. So they won't be able to tell you that an image of a cup is a cup or an image of an eagle is an eagle. But what we find is that patients with visual agnosia are good at acting on objects in the, the, the world, even including objects that they can't necessarily recognise. So, for instance, patients with visual agnosia are able to post accurately slots through uh, letterboxes that are oriented in different ways, but they might have problems in visual discrimination of lines. How is it possible that they can act on something that they can't um, apparently see? Well, of course, uh, here there are different routes, so the, the vision for action route is intact, whereas the vision for uh, perception route is impaired. So the patient has problems in recognising things on a computer screen, but might still be able to act on them in 3D space, at least up to uh, a particular point. Whereas if we damage the, uh, the dorsal stream, what we find is that patients here are good at recognising objects presented to them, but bad at acting on the objects. So for instance, they might misreach to an oriented slot, and that they might uh, miss the slot entirely, or they might hit the slot but have their hand oriented a wrong way. And this is a condition known as optic ataxia. So again, we have what's called a double dissociation between recognising objects and acting on objects, depending on whether the ventral stream or the dorsal stream is damaged. Even in people who don't have um, damage to the brain, we can see a dissociation between uh, recognising uh, objects and acting on them. One illusion is the Titchener Circles illusion, in which a central circle is the same size but appears to be bigger in one case than another. The illusion is driven by the ventral stream, so if we ask people to judge the size of the central circle, 
they would say that one circle looks bigger than the other. But the dorsal stream is not fooled by the illusion. If you replace the central circle with a poker chip, for instance, and ask the person to go in and reach for it, what you find is that the grip aperture, so the size between the, uh, the, the thumb and the forefinger, is not fooled by the illusion. So again, the, uh, the, these two roots work in parallel uh, with each other and give rise to different kinds of behaviour, depending on whether the task is one of recognising or one of acting. One recent contribution of cognitive neuroscience in this field is to dissect the dorsal stream into multiple different regions. So initially the dorsal stream was uh, conceived of as running from the occipital lobes into the parietal lobes. But now we know that within the parietal lobes there's a whole constellation of different regions that support vision and action. Within the intraparietal sulcus there's a number of regions that, that are very important. We can make a distinction between whether or not we've got vision that is guiding eye movements or vision that's guiding hand movements. And there are different regions that support that. So a region called LIP, the lateral intraparietal area, um, responds to visual information, but also responds to preferred directions of eye movements. So here we're linking visual information with particular eye saccades. Another region called the parietal reach region, or PRR, um, responds not only to visual information, but responds to visual information in the context of particular hand movements. So in these regions, neurons would respond not only to vision, but also to whether an action is going in a certain direction. So some neurons might respond to a hand action in this direction, and in LIP, a neuron might respond to an eye movement in that direction, uh, for instance. If we record from these neurons and just give an animal a simple free choice, they, they, they're presented with a visual stimulus, and they can either move their eye to it, or they can move their hand to it. What we find is that the ramping up of activity in these regions predicts whether an animal will later move an eye movement, move their eyes, or later move their hands. So here what we can see is that the parietal lobes are involved in choosing how to act on vision, whether to move a hand or an eye. It will be the frontal lobes that ultimately executes these, but the parietal lobes is kind of acting as an interface between movement uh, and vision. The parietal reach region might also be the key area in optic ataxia. That means that these patients who have damaged this region have problems in reaching to particular points in space. Aside from the distinction between moving the eyes versus moving the hands, another important distinction is whether the hands are simply reaching or whether the hands are grasping. So to grasp an object, one needs to apprehend the actual shape and size uh, as well as the, the, the position in space. And there seems to be a set, another region with, uh, with neurons which have certain properties that are suited to grasping objects. And this has been called AIP, the anterior intraparietal region. Neurons in this area respond um, to certain 3D objects. They, uh, they respond more to 3D objects than, say, line drawings. But they're also tuned, for instance, to size and orientation. And we can contrast this, for instance, with neurons in the ventral stream, which would respond to, say, the, the sight of a mug, but not care what the size or the position or the orientation of the mug is. But if we're to reach for uh, a particular object, we need to know exactly where and how it is oriented in space in order to do that. So the neurons in regions such as AIP are coding, for instance, uh, 3D objects in space in order to be able to grasp them as well as being able to reach them. A final key distinction reflects the nature of the receptive fields in vision for action. Earlier regions within the dorsal stream have retinocentric uh, receptive fields, just as in early visual cortex. So what that means is that visual um, stimulation will activate neurons according to their position um, relative to the centre of the retina. As we progress along the dorsal stream, what we find is that this pattern changes. And instead of having neurons that are centered on the position on the retina, they're centered on positions on the body. So for instance, some neurons might respond to light projected a certain distance or position away from the hand, but irrespective from where the hand is positioned in space, but also irrespective of where the eyes are or the head is in space. Other neurons might be head-centered. So for instance, they um, 
respond to visual information that is near the head or a certain angle from the head, but again, irrespective of where the eyes are pointing in space. Effectively, what has happened here is that we've transformed or remapped in visual information from being centred on the eyes or the retina to being centred on the body. And this is obviously very important for being able to act on visual information.